to do is approach it as um, a as a primer in case there are those out there who really aren't that familiar with Ed. So this is just a primer to give you some basic facts and the quotes, uh, great quotes by Ed McClanahan, uh, who Fantastic. passed away of that course, in November. So also known as Captain Kentucky. Now, Ed was born in uh, Brooksville, Kentucky on October 5th, 1932 to Edward Leroy and Jesse Poge McClanahan. And he attended school in Brooksville and later in nearby Maysville, where, uh, you know, know where that is, you can tell you folks, <laughs> where he, uh, the family re relocated in 1948, uh, 48, 1948. Now, he received a BA in English from Miami University of Ohio in 1955, and then a master's in English from UK here in uh, Lexington in 1958. And he taught comp and creative writing at Oregon State University from 1958 to 62. He received a Stegner Fellowship in Stanford University's non-degree creative writing program for the, uh, the 1962 and three academic year, after which he was selected for a Jones uh, le lectureship by program director Wallace Stegner. And while at Stanford, that's where he became known as Captain Kentucky. So here is Ed talking about his time at Stanford. Quote, it was an exhilarating time to be at Stanford. The anti-war movement and the civil rights movement and the free university movement and the hippie movement and what we might call in retrospect, the general all-purpose up yours movement were all flourishing and I was ardently attached to each and every one. By the mid 60s, I was industriously insinuating myself into every sit in and teach in and be in and love in that happened along. I was also going around the campus in a knee length red velvet cape accessorized with a mod bob haircut and granny glasses and Peter Pan boots. Captain Kentucky, I styled myself, while Daniel Boone turned over in his grave. <laughs> now, during, during this fruitful time for Ed, uh, he became good friends with fellow program alumni, alumnus uh, Ken Kesey, which you might know better as the author of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, among other incredible books and uh, interesting writing. <laughs> uh, he met Ken Kesey through their mutual friendship with, of course, the amazing uh, Wendell Berry. Uh, also, Gurney Norman, amazing, and Robert Stone, just like hear the list here, right? Uh, the, the, the similar ilk of people hanging around Ed McClanahan there. Now, he was an active member of Ken Kesey's Band of Merry Pranksters. I don't know if kids read about that in high school anymore. We read about it in high school <laughs> when I was uh, that age, <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> through Tom Wolfe's book, The Electric Kool Aid Acid Test, really covers the Merry Pranksters, obviously. So, uh, but if you haven't heard of it, um, it was a group of people who traveled around and did uh, merry pranks and uh, hallucinogens and things like that and, you know, changed culture and society. Um, so he Ed later expressed, by the way, that he uh, regret that he did not accompany the merry pranksters on their famous trip or infamous, you might say, bus tour called Further with a U-R at the end, F-U-R-T-H-U-R, which traveled west to east to reverse the historic American Western expansion or at least that was suggested later as the reason. So anyway, uh, he, he was a part of that group, but he did not go on that trip and he regretted it. Uh, Kesey also wanted to see what would happen uh, when hallucinogenic inspired spontaneity confronted what he saw as the banality and com conformity of American society. And Ed was all about that. Tom Wolfe's bestseller, like I said, uh, the electric Kool-Aid acid test gave the Mary Pranksters worldwide nor notoriety. Uh, and of course, McClan's memoir, uh, Famous People I Have Known, hilariously recollects many of the prankster, his prankster experiences. Uh, Ed told a hilarious story I found on the internet when I was looking into this, by the way, about, um, maybe everybody already knows this, but it was new to me, <laughs> about how the Smithsonian in the, the late 80s contacted Kesey about giving them the original bus that they painted. And Ed said, by the way, that the paint was some places on that bus an inch thick because they would just paint it for different events. <clears throat> if somebody needed a black bus, they would paint it black. You know, if they needed to go back to psychedelic, they go back to psychedelic. If they took a notion, whatever. So they just kept painting and painting and painting this bus. And he said it was sitting in the back of Kesey's place in a swamp. So he's like, I don't think I could get you the original bus. But then they had this idea of this prank and they made a, a, a replica of the bus <laughs> out of a newer bus and they were driving it across the country. And, and then while everybody was in at an event as part of this whole hubbub, they moved the bus and drew an outline where it used to be and said, don't never believe the Mary Pranksters or something like that. It's a really great story. And of course, the Smithsonian had to find out that they 
they can't give you the original bus it's in too bad a shape and they offered to fix it up but he's like no no it, you can't fix it up but you know as ed pointed out it wasn't really the original bus anyway it's like that ship of uh thebes is that what it's called where they kept replacing the planks until is it the same ship anymore you know that kind of thing that's what it sounded like to me um anyway in 1968 he signed, uh, this is significant, I think, the Writers and Editors Worth Tax Protest Pledge, where he vowed to refuse making tax payments in protest against the Vietnam War. <clears throat> Loved hearing that. So uh, he taught at, in his time of teaching, he taught at Stanford, UK, University of Montana, Northern Kentucky University. He and his contemporaries, Wendell Berry, James Baker Hall, Bobby Ann Mason, uh, and Gurney Norman came to be known as the Fab Five. Five, yeah, I'll get it right. Fab Five group of Kentucky writers, products of the creative writing program at the University of Kentucky. When his position at uh, NKU came to an end, uh, he used the unexpected time off to finish his first novel, The Natural Man, which uh, he used his free time to edit entirely from first person to third person, which he said brought the novel to life and inspired him to finish it. And as a writer, I'm fascinated by process. So that you know, I loved reading about uh, how this unexpected time off and he didn't he didn't plan on it. He wanted to keep teaching, I think. But, you know, he used the time that was given to him, surprisingly, to finish this novel and actually rewrite it. And he said it just brought it to life for him. Uh, the novel, which was actually conceived in 1961, uh, but was not finished until 1983, was published to wide and enthusiastic acclaim. About the natural man, Kentucky and Wendell Berry said, others have observed the natural man in the American condition before, but nobody has done it with such good humor. Ed McClanahan's good humor both sharpens his eye and gentles his vision. I don't know where else you would find workmanship that is at once so meticulous and so exuberant. Now, over the years, Ed published his hilarious and brilliant short stories, essays, and reviews in all kinds of places in magazines, including like Esquire, uh, Rolling Stone and Playboy. Yes, they published writing of a non-erotic nature back in the day. I know that's the joke. People you read Playboy for the reading, but seriously, those of us who are nerds did that. There was fiction in there, there were essays, and they were known at one time for publishing great writing. And probably most people know that, but just in case. Um, and um, he in 1972 and 74, he received Playboy's award for nonfiction. Uh, after being identified by Esquire as a new hip writer with some other people on the same list, he said, here's this quote, little old unpublished me, he wrote in uh, Famous People I've Known, he said, suddenly wallowing right up there cheek to jowl with the biggest fish in the biggest pond of all, Mailer, Styron, Baldwin, Salinger, Bellow, and McClanahan? He didn't consider Classic. himself a writer in the fancy sense, but rather, as he put it, one who spent his time, quote, following my nose, my muse, and sometimes my muse's nose. <laughs> he lived here in Lexington for many years where he took long walks, waved at his neighbors and wrote. Here are some quotes by Ed that I thought I would end with today because I like the man to speak for himself. Here's one, quote, well, that thought occurred to me when my story, Grateful Dead, I have known first appeared in Playboy. I figured every barber shop and pool hall in America would have it in their racks. And pretty soon uh, I was going to be known by every pool shark everywhere. And sure enough, my own barber had it on hand when I arrived for my next haircut. And when he asked me how I wanted my cut to look, I opened the magazine and pointed to the picture of me that ran with the story and said, I want it to look just like that. He nodded his head and then immediately turned the page over to the centerfold. I said, but, but wait, don't you see that the guy I pointed to is actually me? He really didn't care about me or that particular piece of writing one bit. And it was a hard way to find out that most people wouldn't. And by the way, not that I compare myself even closely to Ed McClanahan, but I felt for him there because I've experienced the same thing. You publish something and even your friends and people who want you to succeed, they're like, you publish cool. And then nobody reads. It. <laughs> I feel you in. And your writing was way better than mine. So, you know, I can take some comfort there. Here's another quote. I write what I like to call fiction-infused autobiography, by which I mean stories rooted in autobiographical fact, but which are also subject to the demands of good storytelling. So I don't hesitate to amend or omit inconvenient trivia in service to a good, lively narrative. In that respect, I guess I'm the quintessential unreliable narrator. But as my late West Virginia writer friend Chuck Kinder used to put it, sometimes you just have to go where the story takes you. And the final quote I wanted to give you he said, quote, for me, 
Writing is like performing brain surgery on yourself. It's not something you want to rush. Ed McClanahan died on November 27th, 2021 at the age of 89. So there's a little primer for Ed McClanahan. <clears throat> That's Leif Erickson. Um, Leif, what's the big idea? You're finishing up early. I'm still waiting for our guests to show up. <laughs> oh, <That's... laughs> because I wanted to leave plenty of time for the awesome list of guests. I do appreciate that. that. I just got a message from uh, Bobby Ann Mason saying uh -huh. that she, here's Tom Marksbury. Uh, Bobby Ann Mason said she was running a little late and she was going to be here. We've got uh, Tom Marksbury is popping in here in a second. So you've been... Uh, You've got a retrieve, a reprieve. I said a retrieve. We've got to retrieve Tom Marksbury from That sounds the, uh, like a wordplay Ed would do, uh, retrieve and reprieve. There's got to be some play in there. Right? He would totally uh, Tom Marksbury is, is, is here. Tom, we didn't expect to just like toss you into the, into the, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever you get tossed into digitally <laughs> these days. Um, so we'll let, we'll give him a second to get his uh, technology squared away. Uh, Leif Erickson and I are here. This is Trivial Thursdays, and we are uh, celebrating the life of Ed McClanahan, uh, the great Kentucky writer, Captain Kentucky. Has that uh, got me unmuted? No, there you go. There's you're, you're Lewis, and there's Tom Marksbury. Good morning. Hi, Tom. Howdy. How are you all today? Good. We're Welcome. good. It's nice to see you. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Absolutely. Um, now let's see. So, um, we, uh, Leaf just gave kind of a, Leaf did a sort of, um, bio overview, you might say, I suppose, of, uh, of Ed, you know, which is going to be lacking, not because it's Leaf, but because Ed is Ed, right? Um, and, uh, you and, you and Ed McClanahan, Tom, Tom Marksbury, you guys were long acquainted. You, of course, have been involved in producing some incredible documentary films, uh, films on Warren Oates, Ben Johnson, Nick Nolte, Sam Peckinpah, Todd Browning, um, and among other things. So we're thrilled to have you here, Tom. Tom, actually, did you not come on the show with Ed one time? Isn't it? Do you yes. do I remember correctly? Yes, we did. Ed That's and I made the rounds. That was a, a memorable day for me. Yes. <laughs> in the studio we had you in the studio in the flesh back in those days now um so it would you are uh i love that i'm noting here from something i see online that you're uh that one of your awards is as a wrangler for the national cowboy museum and hall of fame <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm very proud of that i was gonna say that's something you really hold up there don't you that's my uh, only alpha male achievement <laughs> now do you so you know this it's such a it, 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 it's a I'm trying to figure out how to how to how to sort of zoom the lens in but do you want to talk about some of I don't know how you became acquainted with Ed how you all became friends yeah it's uh 40 years of bad road but uh I met Ed <laughs> when I was a student at Transylvania and he interviewed there for a job and I guess they held the job in such low esteem that I was the head of a student committee to do the interviewing. And Ed thought he had the job for sure because I was just in awe of him and Natural Man hadn't even come out yet, but I'd read him in Rolling Stone and Gurney Norman and Ed were both my Kentucky touchstones to the counterculture. And I was just, uh, just a fanboy, you know. But he never got the job and he never got anywhere, but we got to be friends. And he gave me uh, the, the first 50 pages of Natural Man when it was still written in first person. And I, I love the story of how long he labored on that thing. You know, he, Esquire Magazine put him in the red hot center of American fiction in 1963 when he was a graduate student at Stanford. And Natural Man didn't come out for 20 years. So it's an interesting career trajectory. And I love, uh, being with Ed was like, it's an education you cannot buy. And uh, I, I thought that the Natural Man was just perfect the way it was, but he wasn't satisfied with it. And what finally happened five years later, he decided that, that it was ultimately uh, the sort of, self-pitying defensive revenge on the parochial values of his own small town i mean there's not a smudge of that left in the book but he thought that moving it from uh 
first person to third somehow eliminated that and and it did and i remember the way he described it he said it was like opening up the windows in a stale airless room and you know you learn more about writing from things like that than anything you're going to get in school that's tom marksbury um and and tom you, you you touch on some really i think significant things and one of them is that every every writer isn't a great writing teacher necessarily um, but Ed McClanahan was, and he had a knack, uh, this, this, you know, I can't help but think of the term that I've heard, uh, which is, uh, I'm sure everyone in this room is familiar with a kill, kill your darlings, you know, killing your darlings. And that's something that is really, really hard for people to learn. It's incredible that Ed could teach it and it was also didn't hold himself above it either. Yeah, I've heard that phrase attributed to everybody from O. Henry to Faulkner to Hemingway to Allen Ginsberg to, and it's it's one of those things like write what you know. I don't completely trust it. I, it's like you should write what you don't know and probably cultivate your darling. But yeah, Ed, <laughs> Ed sort of embodies that. Um, well, he had he didn't really see any difference between teaching and friendship. I don't think, and he had one of the things I wanted to say is he had just a genius for friendship. God, I'll say like that's such art. a great way of putting it. He treated it like an art form, you know, but you've was, got some I, other folks signed on here. It looks like now we you. do. And I want to introduce them. Um, and, uh, so Tom Eblen is here from the Carnegie center. Um, happy to see you, Tom. And, and you came in, I thought Tommy came in at just the right moment. Cause we were talking about some of the aspects of Ed, McClanahan, the teacher, the writing teacher, sometimes, yeah. sometimes teaching himself and holding himself to the same standard that he would hold his students to in terms of, you know, what, what Tom Marksbury was saying about the natural man and Ed not being really satisfied with it the way it was. And God, I just think about, I think so much about some of the things that I, that any of us might work on where you're just like, you just get in this groove, you get in this groove of the way it is and, and you can't, and you can't shake that. And a lot of becoming a better writer is, is being able to kind of let go of those precious words because there may be better yeah. ones behind them. Yeah, yeah, well, you have to be able to look at it the way readers will look at it, and that's always the hard thing. You know, and uh, Ed, Ed and, and most great writers are like that. They can kind of step back from their work. Yeah. Um, and I love, so the people are just piling in here. Uh, as I'm working this Zoom, I want to say, I want to welcome them uh we've got uh, so paul wagner the the filmmaker is here hi paul um paul made um congress of wonders which we're going to talk about a little while the 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 short film that was based on an ed mcclanahan story um our beloved friend guy mendez is here um the photographer and um bon vivant and uh a former editor of the blue tail fly at the university of kentucky and uh Happy to have him. John Lackey, uh, the artist, musician, uh, writer, um, Walker, <laughs> um, <laughs> is here. And uh, JT Dockery is here as well. Um, it's been a while since we've had uh, this. I have to look around the Zoom here to be like, okay, did I, did I miss anybody? I don't think so. Um, I'm happy to have all of you all here and... Um, we're looking, uh, I, I received a message from Bobby Ann Mason that she was running a little late, so we're looking forward to Bobby Ann joining us too. But I, ju I just feel like we have, it. Guy, Guy Mendez, I want to say hi, and also thanks to Guy for really assembling this this group of, uh, to, to paraphrase you, McClana fans. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not responsible. <laughs> You're not responsible. <laughs> Well, well, uh, well, I, well, I'm, I'm grateful for your lack of responsibility then, because we've wound up with a really great group here. Um, Guy, there was uh, for for the last number of years, in particular. I mean, you and Ed have a relationship that, that, like several people here, that goes back decades. But for the last several years, if I saw if I saw Guy Mendez, I expected to see uh, Ed McClanahan too. Look at that hat! It's the Captain it's the Kentucky hat. hat. Uh, Let's. Let's talk Ed, about that hat. Ed's uh, kids, Kate and Chris and Bill and Annie, bequeathed this hat to me. It's the hat he was wearing in the Captain Kentucky uh, photograph that we made in the halls of um, Hanover Towers, uh, 1974 or so. 
and uh, I hesitate Great to put photo. it on. It hasn't been cleaned in a long time, I don't think. <laughs> Maybe it was never clean. And, and then it goes along with this shirt, which, you know, in the pictures I made of him a couple of years ago, looks pretty good. But when you get it home, it's all falling apart. It's tatters, you know, it's like it's coming apart. <laughs> so I don't know whether you make this into a wall hanging or what. What do you think? Right. I don't know. I do know. I'm, I, I'm happy, we have to talk about the hat some more because I'm curious if it, it, I don't think I missed you say maybe if you have any idea where the hat came from or for that matter, what kind of hat it is. It sort of vaguely resembles what in marching band circles is called a, a, a Shaco hat, I believe, yeah. uh, you know, one of those sort of pillbox hats, but it's not quite that either. It looks a bit Russian or and it's got a metal on it that's it looks Russian. Um, <laughs> when I when I first met Ed, he came to my door on South Limestone Street. I was living in an apartment that is now the building where the U U University Press of Kentucky is. And I was just helping to start putting putting out the blue tail fly. And I knew about Ed McClanahan from Wendell and Tanya Berry. And um, and he came to the door and he had on lime green sunglasses and uh, a moose lodge band director's hat which was similar to this hat but not quite as big uh but, but strange it had a moose on it you know and uh <laughs> he walked right in and that was the beginning of a long friendship and uh we published uh, some some writing of his in the blue tail fly and uh, a series of poems by james baker hall about captain kentucky and with pictures by jim of uh, Captain Kentucky and his California world. Um, huh. There he is. There he, that's the hat. Such a great yeah. photo. <laughs> when uh, I, I never tire of looking at this photo, uh, guy. Uh, I, I, I look at I look at everything. I look at the lamps. I look at the 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 the, the racing stripes on the carpet. I look at the shield of arms on the floor. Well, John, you talked of the hat. <laughs> you know, it was it was um, in. Ed's mother-in-law lived in Hanover Towers, uh, you know, also called Menopause Manor, you know, and uh, it was a lot of little old ladies. And uh, I was on my knees with my Hasselblad and uh, the woman opened that doorway on the right-hand side of the picture and started to come out of it. And she saw me and Ed and she gasped audibly and slammed the door, you know, went back inside. And, uh, so <laughs> And, you know, I wasn't sure that that uh, light coming out from behind his head would register, you know, show up in the image, uh, but it, it sure did. <laughs> so. yeah, that's great. That's Guy Mendez. Um, that's a, you know, there's something, the, one of the things that appeals to me so much about this photo, and, and, I, and I register it somewhat as a photographer too, but it reminds me of a time when me and my other photographer friends love to just go around taking weird pictures of ourselves, basically. <laughs> um, the artier, the better, sort of. And and it kind of made our day-to-day -day life just the, an adventure, you know? It was every, who knew what was going to happen next? And and that's something, that's a value that I feel like I always, that it just radiated off of Ed McClanahan, I felt like, that that attitude of like, well, here's the next adventure. What's, what's going to happen? The hippie vibe. <laughs> There you go, yeah. And then you know, pro probably the biggest challenge might have been getting any of that down on paper before before it sort of went away in a puff of smoke, if you will. A lot of things went away in puffs of smoke. <laughs> this is this is Trivial Thursdays, and uh, happy to be here with my co-host Lee Erickson, as well as um, a, a, a cavalcade of fine folks and friends uh, celebrating the life of Ed McClanahan. Uh, Tom Marksbury's here, uh, Tom Evelyn, uh, Paul Wagner, Guy Mendez, John Lackey, JT Dockery, um, and Lee Owen. And there's going to be more, don't worry. So uh, <laughs> um, let's see, We um, what's the next place to go? As you know, we plan the show very carefully. Right. Very so um, <laughs> <laughs> I can just put my co-host Leif Erickson on the spot and be like, Leif, where should we go with this? <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, if I could uh, bring uh, Jay Todd into the conversation for a moment, and being that I love process as much as I do, and I know you and Ed work together a lot, so or at least some, so I was curious, like, what was your all's process for working together? 
I, there really wasn't a process. <laughs> That's what I suspect. Uh, John, I, I admit, I'm kind of the junior member here, right? Uh, right? Like, I, I'm going to turn 46 on sa- uh, Saturday. And, you know, I was reading Ed, had gone to readings by Ed, and had met Ed casually, but didn't really know Ed. And then John Lackey, when Ed was talking about wanting to do, you know, comics versions of his work, specifically uh, Juanita uh, and the Frog Prince, you know, from the book Congress of Wonders, which Paul Wagner adapted <clears throat> to cinema. Uh, yeah, it, it, it just called me up and um, we corresponded, we would talk. Uh, and then with those weekly before the pandemic, before the plague came in, you know, those weekly sort of meetings, I didn't come every week, but I would show up every few weeks or every couple of months, kind of show Ed what was happening. Ed pretty much gave me a free reign. He just said, you know, d- you know, adapt it. And then he was just what, I, what he saw he liked. And our questions would be more specific, like what kind of shoes do you think Juanita would drive? You know, what kind of car would Skidmore drive, you know, the character? And so, you know, it really was, uh, you know, Ed just thought I was adapting it correctly. So the process was just more like, Hey Ed, here's what I've done, and he'd go ha ha ha, and he'd dig it, you know. And then you know, it really wasn't um, too much going over things bit by bit. I mean, Ed would say he did say that the our book that we did together was more my book than his book, but I would always say to Ed, "Hey, it wouldn't exist without you." So it's sort of the Burroughs Geisen third mind idea, right? You know, yeah. there's something else came out of Ed and I collaborating. And I'm sure, you know, Paul Wagner would say the same thing. He made his movie version of Ed's work, but it wouldn't have, he never would have made the movie without Ed's work. So it all, it all kind of fits, you know, but it wasn't like Ed was looking over my shoulder and said, move this panel here or, or right. change this or do that. It was just, I right. made a comic based on Ed's work. So I was the director, like a movie director would be a movie director, but, you know, still all based and adapted from right. Ed's work. Yeah, he respected. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to kind of concur with that. My experience was exactly the same. Uh, And I found it actually kind of amazing, because if you think about it, we all know how Ed worked on his his work, the written word. Okay, he worked over these sentences for 25 years. Right, Tom? (laughs) And, And then for him to like turn that sentence over to, uh, you know, uh, an illustrated book writer or to a filmmaker, you know, I was expecting him to like be right on me every second, you know, it's got to be this way, it's got to be this way, but it just goes <laughs> as generosity of spirit that he just, yes, he wanted to contribute because he was excited about it, and I know he was excited about the the novel, the Juanita uh, book, uh, and he was similarly excited about Congress Wonders film, but he was incredibly giving and uh, and forgiving <laughs> of of my efforts certainly uh, on the Congress film and uh, I, I, I he was thrilled with then and and now of the um, the uh, Faulkner quote I think it was you know who was asked well aren't you worried that film, that Hollywood or filmmakers are destroying your novels and Faulkner just turns around and motions to the bookshelf and says. Nope, they're all right there, just like I wrote them. And uh, I think that was sort of Ed's take, um, you know, that he had such confidence and comfort with his own work that he didn't really worry. Uh, he, he was able to enjoy the process rather than be disturbed by it. He was thrilled with both of your all's work. Um, and it reminds me, Jim Hall once said, that Ed liked every picture he took of him. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> While we're talking uh, about movies, I just wanted to mention the uh, backstory on the Natural Man as a film. Ed always dreamed that that would be a film, and uh, in fact, Ned Beatty very much wanted to play the coach, which would have been perfect. Yeah. And I haven't given point, up on that dream either, Tom. So we need to talk. Well, more. Paul, yes, yeah, yeah. let's resurrect that. We're we're the ones. Do you remember when he was talking to that guy that wrote Ten Cup? He was a friend of Ron Shelton's. 
Right. I, re I remember that, but I don't remember it well. So remind me of what, what the story was. And then, uh, well, there was some talk that maybe get you in on it and I was going to help and it was all going to get resurrected. And he had sold the book to Universal and That's they right. wouldn't they wouldn't let go of it, but they wouldn't make the movie either, which is arguably the perfect position to be in. You know, you of get course. your movie, get your money and you don't have to suffer through the movie. But yeah. Paul, I think now is our, I have heard through Kate that that's 30 years past or something legally has happened to where that's possible. And I, we're still young enough. Let's make a strike. Uh, of course we are. <laughs> it sounds good. It sounds good, Tom. Hey, I'll tell you what, why don't we, um, I, I, hey, Paul, I, I can play the Congress of Wonders trailer for the people who are watching on Facebook well, that'd be Live. Great. They can watch oh, that'd be great. it. Great watch, idea. Yeah. yeah. And I watched the movie last night and I just, so this is Paul Wagner's movie. Now, Congress of Wonders is adapted from an Ed McClanahan story, but also, but he was also a, was he a script writer on this too? Yeah, or did yeah, you we, all? We wrote the script together and essentially produced it together uh, uh, also. Uh, okay. But yeah, play the, play the trail. That'd be great. I, actually haven't seen the, I watched the film the other night, but I haven't seen the trailer in years. <laughs> So this is Congress of Wonders, uh, the trailer for Congress of Wonders, a short film made by Paul Wagner. Uh, oh, yes, in the DVD. <laughs> uh, Thanks, so man. check this out. And we will, we'll be back. I'll play a song then after that, too. Okay, so stick around, everybody. This is Trivial Thursdays, and we're celebrating Ed McClanahan. This way, this way, this way, this way. It's sensational, it's terrific, it's educational, it's scientific. Marvels and monstrosities, freaks of nature and facts of life, miracles of modern medical science, and throwbacks to the dark ages of history. See it all, my friends. Brought to you at exorbitant expense by yours truly, untimely... Hey, hey, where's that lecture go at? Inside, Admiral.
away I feel like a bat My signal ain't coming back Just disappears out into the night And we don't learn too fast here That big money machine puts nothing back Call the governor, call the president See how long our way can last While the poison washes over portion of WRFL's programming is made possible in part by Street Scene Vintage. Street Scene offers a retro environment and a variety of housewares, furniture, clothing, and accessories. Street Scene is located at 2575 Regency Road. For more information, you can visit streetscenevintage.com or call 859-260-1578. WRFL thanks Street Scene Vintage for supporting college radio. Open, to open. This is James Baker Hall. You're listening to WRFL 88.1. Uh, I sure treasure that ID there, that James yes. Baker Hall ID. <laughs> <laughs> um, Warren Byram and the Fabled Cane Lands with the title track from that record from 2011. Um, and let's see, we are back. This is Trivial Thursdays on WRFL. We're here with a collection of wonderful folks to celebrate um, our uh, friend. And, you know, one of those cliched phrases uh, that that I feel I was thinking about this earlier that I think Ed would actually like is the late great. You know, that's something that I really avoid <laughs> using. But but I would say the late great Ed McClanahan. And I feel like he would like that. Yeah, he loved cr- cliches. So, hey, that's perfect. <laughs> right. Uh, that's Paul Wagner. We uh, we were checking out the the trailer for Congress of Wonders, um, a fascinating short film that was made in ninety uh, two. Is that right? No. God, what? What? Tom, refresh my memory. <laughs> yeah, it was three months before my son was born, so I think ninety three. Actually, yeah. there you go. Okay. What a and, great uh, film. You know, I loved as much as I, I loved the film. I watched it last night. I'm not sure I'd ever seen it before. Um, 
<clears throat> and one of the things I loved the most was actually watching the credits at the end. I don't think I've ever so closely read credits and seen so many names that I knew. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was. McNeese. It was an incredible community. Uh, Pat McNeese was, work on it? Oh, yeah. Yes. Pat, yeah. absolutely. The late, great key, Pat McNeese. Key to it. I mean, I, I think about the people involved in it, including Tom, of course, uh, here with us. But if you couldn't have subtracted any one of those people and had it, the whole thing work, it was just like a miracle collision of just the right minds and hearts and souls uh, that came together. And of course, it, it wasn't an accident. It was all about Ed. It was people who understood Ed and who trusted Ed's work. And I was only admitted to the group because Ed trusted me with it, really. And, uh, you know, the it was... So it wasn't just it wasn't just that the work the writing was so great it was that ed's persona you know he he was the the leader the the emotional and creative leader of the group and all those people uh, assembled around him starting with tom uh, who i was, was gonna smart. say can we talk about tom and your oh role God. how did that come about the performance the of the ages well <laughs> you know as as uh, as i'm saying Ed absolutely said it was almost like he wouldn't let me make the film if I didn't cast Tom as Jojo. <laughs> and at first I'm like, well, wait a minute, who is this Tom Marksbury guy? Can he act? Well, no, he's never <laughs> acted. <laughs> well, what do you what do you mean? Why do I have to cast him? You know, I mean, that's the last thing a director wants to hear, right? And of course, I met Tom and I went, oh yeah, that's Jojo. <laughs> and uh, Ed was absolutely right. You know, what I mean, Tom is effing brilliant i don't know what we can say on the station but he is effing brilliant you can say uh, you can say effing we appreciate that <laughs> <Okay, good. laughs> well, right. i feel like i wasn't so much an actor as a glorified uh, special effect really but as, uh, <laughs> as the script says about jojo uh it's something you ought to see <laughs> when, when, no, i think when, that that's accurate yeah yeah. One funny story, Tom, I don't know if you remember this or if you were witness to it, but um, there's a line after there's a scene with um, you and uh, Wanda Pearl, who was played by a, a wonderful actress. I think she was from Louisville named Melissa Combs, and she's still around, I think, as a singer in Kentucky. And Melissa, then maybe now, was a pretty serious Christian woman. I and was there. Ed, do you remember this, Tom? She did not want to say the line, which happens in that scene after you're after she escorts you out of the tent. The line is, "My sweet Jesus H Christ on a crutch." I don't know if I'm allowed to say that on <laughs> on this station, but nothing's. Yes, you can say it. crutch. You can say crutch on the air, <laughs> okay. no problem. At any rate, Melissa, God bless her, uh, you know, had some moral qualms about saying that line, and I'll never forget. Ed just kind of took her aside and made it clear to her that Wanda Pearl was the embodiment of goodness and love in the whole story, was that she was the core of, of love. And anything that she said could, by definition, not be profane. And Melissa went with it. What he said was, because uh, this is Ed through and through, he said, Melissa, think of it this way, that, that profanity for, for her, that character is a form of prayer. Right. And that sold it. That's yes. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, absolutely. This is Trivial Thursdays on WRFL Lexington. It's a couple minutes before 11 o'clock in the morning, and uh, we are celebrating Ed McClanahan, the great writer, and Bon Vivant. If ever there was a Bon Vivant, it seems like it's it's uh, Ed McClanahan. Um, we're here with uh, a, a, a with a with a, our very own Congress of Wonders cast of characters. Um, <laughs> Tom Marksbury is here as well as uh, Tom Eblen, um, Paul Wagner, John Lackey, J.T. Dockery, uh, the musician Lee Owen, who is going to play a song here in a second, and the photographer Guy Mendes, along with um, Leif Erickson. Um, let's see, so we... It, it is funny how... I don't know how community just seemed to... It, it, I'd love to revisit the thing about Guy... about um, About Ed's his 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 uh his his friendliness his his conviviality um last night when i was thinking about this show and how excited i was about it in a lot of ways 
one of the things that I remembered about Ed, who was on the show a good number of times, was um, I felt there was nothing that felt so good to me as my name coming out of Ed McClanahan's mouth. <laughs> And I was just so honored to even have him as that much of a friend that he would even know my name. <laughs> and there was just something about that, just the, the the way these things that would just radiate from Ed McClanahan. And I can still picture Guy Mendez and bringing Ed into the studio at RFL and just the room would seem to get lighter when Ed would walk in. <laughs> and I was wondering if, um, let's see, if, if let's hear, who have we, let's see, jo uh, Johnny, we haven't really, we haven't, caught up with you much um you 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 became a pretty regular companion of ed's too in sort of social situations maybe going for walks i'm not sure um how did your how did you do you remember when you first became aware of uh, of ed as someone you might like to to visit with or or collaborate with or or just even just you know take in if you will uh well um can you hear me Yep. I said it made my dog stop barking. The wind blew the wrong way. I didn't. Yeah, I was like, wow, I didn't know Johnny was so shy. He got up and bolted away from the camera just as soon as I mentioned him. I have a really loud dog. And he's old and lazy. So he'll bark at whatever that danger is out front from upstairs. Um, uh, in 1987, some friends and I took a Greyhound bus to San Francisco to see the Grateful Dead New Year's Eve run of shows, which... Uh, I recommend that. I don't recommend taking the bus back, but uh, we were we were just greasy and sleep deprived and cranky. But my friend pulled out of her backpack a copy of uh, Famous People I've Known and gave me crap for not having read it. So I read it on the way back, uh, I think twice. <laughs> it's a long bus ride. And so that's how I got to know Ed and fell in love with his, his uh, cadence and character and writing and everything. And um, and then like a lot of, uh, like knowing Pat McNeese and like knowing a, the, the tree that my life became grew out of the trunk of working at Alfalfa's uh, where Jake Gibbs hired me that same year. So I met Ed, I met Ed's kids first and uh, uh, Jess and Chris and Kate and, uh, and then became a fan of Ed's and got to know him somewhat, but uh, in uh, 2001, when uh, Ken Kesey passed away, they had to um, put out the seventh issue of Spit in the Ocean, a book that they've been working on over the years. So uh, I forget, one of his kids said, well, get John Lackey to help you lay it out. And uh, so I went over and helped him lay it out. And Kesey was my favorite author. So I said, what if I do a block print of Kesey? We submit it if Penguin or Viking, whoever it was, wants to put it in the book, would that be cool? And they did. So when the book came out a year or two later, he gathered everybody and said, anybody that worked on the book can uh, go on the book tour up and down the West Coast from Kesey's farm on the bus. Um, and so I did, and Ed and I got little motel rooms next to each other up in the big trees and uh, not far from Kesey's farm. And we get up every morning and have coffee and oatmeal and and uh, smoke and head over to the farm and and they were painting the bus and practicing plays and songs <laughs> and uh it was everybody just about everybody that's an electric kool-aid acid test was on the bus plus uh wavy gravy and mountain girl and at times uh gus van zant was at some of the performances and um wendell berry came to one and ed's daughter annie and and uh, and so I really got to be really, really good friends with Ed sitting on beanbag chairs in the bus, drinking scotch with wavy gravy and just and it just Ed's just such a warm. Uh, I just always think he's a kindred spirit. He's just a, he's a he's a fun, funny, warm connector. Um, uh, and then I have one other little story about him and I'll stop But We we live next door to Jimmy Saka, Jr. And his father was Jimmy Saka that was in the uh, in the uh, Hilltoppers and in Ed's book. And Ed, Ed uh, loves to talk. He'd love to talk about Jimmy Saka. Well, he had that part where he he came home from California, got drunk at a Hilltoppers show, threw up on Jimmy Saka's car and fell asleep in the back seat and then woke up to Jimmy Saka getting ready to beat him up. And so he asked for Jimmy Saka's autograph. And so Jimmy Saka 
puffed up and signed a pack of matches and, and then gave Ed a ride home and Ed woke up and his roommate was burning the matches. So for Ed's <laughs> 70th birthday, I asked Jimmy Saka if I, I was going to ask him if I could get his dad to sign a new pack of matches for him to replace the ones. And Jimmy said, oh, I, I don't know. We're not real crazy about the way dad was portrayed in that book. I don't know. So I didn't pursue it. And when I got to be friends with Ed a couple years later, I told him about that about wanting to replace his matches that he got signed by Jimmy Sack and Ed said, uh, oh, well that may or may not have really happened. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I don't think I ate for a couple of days after that. It just blew my mind. I was like, you can do that? It is incredible, right? Yeah. And it's, and it's something that Ed kind of, it seemed like he gave people permission, not that he's the first or the last to do that, but as a writer, it somehow it seems so acceptable coming from Ed where you're like, okay, I'm definitely probably, you know, the fish, this, this may not have been this big of a fish, but the way it's being, the way it's being described, yeah. I love the size of this fish. <laughs> yeah. Do you want a good story or not? Well, this story is kind of the flip side of that. I wanted to get this in there. Ed's uh, and hats off to Fred who played Rex Road in, in uh, Paul's movie who Rex Road is a con man often called a sky grifter he's a fake evangelist and his his big thing was he'd come into small rural kentucky towns and uh with a movie called mom and dad which the morning showing was purported to be a sex hygiene tape and the evening showing was for the men only and was purported to be you know pornographic and rex road appears in all of ed's fictions so he's in natural man he's kind of the star of congress of wonders and he's in those other two stories and he kind of holds all that together. And Tom Thurman and I wanted to make a movie where Ed played Rex Road. <laughs> and uh, because all this had been inspired by Ed's memory of mom and dad coming to his town when he was a kid. And it, so we were all going to go to New Orleans and make this movie. And it's not the greatest movie in the world, but we had a hell of a good time. Uh, but this guy appeared in the middle of this process whose name is, um, I've got it written down here. He's the real Rex Road. Uh, oh. he, he was a partner of Herschel Gordon Lewis. They made 2000 Maniacs and Blood Feast. He's sort of schlock horror. He's the Antonioni of schlock horror movies. And he had actually done that. And, and he ran a carnival and, and he was Rex Road. David Friedman, that's his name. Right. And so this guy turns up in New Orleans and here's this whole history of grifting and carny and sleaze and it's all real. It's the opposite of it. And the, the reality always synchronized with Ed's imagination that things would happen when you were around Ed that seemed to be fictional that just came to life. That's Tom Marksbury. Um, That's great. <laughs> And thank you for that, for sharing that, Tom. Um, much appreciated. Um, this is Trivial Thursdays on WRFL. And um, let's see, we're here with a cavalcade of Ed McClana fans. And um, we have been, uh, I'll give uh, Bobby Ann Mason a chance to get herself. Sometimes you need a Zoom minute, right? You need a Zoom second to get yourself squared away. <laughs> <laughs> has this been coined yet somebody needs to do that probably they already have <laughs> you know when somebody first comes into a zoom thing you're like just give them a second you know they're like everybody's pushing buttons turning this on turning that off um we are celebrating ed mcclanahan um the uh the writer character mary prankster really mary prankster kind of sums it up in some ways <laughs> um and so you know i'll tell you what let's take uh, lee owen is here um Lee from Born Cross-Eyed. Uh, can you say hi for a second, Lee? Hey, hoping my microphone works. Sounding great. You're sounding great. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a, a term that I haven't coined for uh, for waiting with anticipation to see whether a musician's going to sound okay on Zoom. Uh, you sound good. <laughs> so uh, so um, this kind of sort of leads us into, you were going to play, you we, are kind enough to join us, Lee, to play a track or two that you knew to be favorites of uh, Ed's and so I'm curious what your th what sort of thought process went into that for you. 
Well, I was really lucky to, to hang out with Ed a few times. You know, I've been in Born Crosshead. We started in 1991, so we just turned 30. And our drummer, Mark Vanderbo, was a good buddy with Ed, as was Johnny Lackey, and they're good friends of mine. So over the years, I had lunch with Ed with those guys, and we would hang out. Mark would have a Labor Day party, and we'd all hang out. So we sort of had a loose relationship. Well, when Born Crosshead turned 20, Ed came and gave a speech. Over the years, actually, Ed got up in front of Born Crosshide and talked multiple times. But the 20th anniversary, he got up and he talked about the Grateful Dead song, New Speedway Boogie. And it was just really neat to hear him talk. I really wish somebody had videoed it. Maybe they did. I don't know. It's been 10 years, obviously. But it, it was great to have him up there sort of telling the story. And then afterwards, we played New Speedway Boogie as, as part of our deal. So anyway, when you guys sent an email saying, you know, come do this. Of course, Johnny had also suggested New Speedway because he knew that was a big favorite of Ed's. So uh, as a representative of Born Crosside, I'm going to go ahead and do New Speedway Boogie for you guys. And I'm just lucky to have had some moments with Ed. And, and like you said earlier, you were so proud that when he would just talk to you that, that Ed McClanahan knew your name. And yes, I sort of remember yes. that I could absolutely relate to that. I remember, you know, we had met a few times, but I didn't really think he knew me. And so I would see him and he'd say, hey, Lee, how are you? And it was just like, oh, Ed McClanahan knows who I am. And I just felt so honored. Anyway, I'm honored that you guys asked me to be here today. I thought the world of the guy. And so Here's new Speedway Boogie for Ed McClanahan. This is the Owen. Please don't dominate the rap, Jack. You've got nothing new to say. If you please don't back up the track, this train has got to run today. I spent a little time on the mountain, spent a little time on the hill. Heard some say you better run away, others say you better stand still. I don't know, I was told it's hard to run. With the way to go Other times I've heard it said It's just as hard With the way to blend style with one step done and another begun i wonder how many miles spent a little time on the mountain spent a little time on the hill things went down we don't understand i think in time we will i don't know but i was told in the heat of the sun, man died of cold. Keep on running, old stand and wait. With the sun so dark and the hours so late. Darkness has got to give. 
One way or another One way or another No one way or another This darkness has got to give Fantastic. That's Lee Owen at Born Cross-Eyed. Lee, you sound fantastic. Well, thank you. Again, I'm so honored you guys asked me to be part of this. I really just feel just, it was such a treat to know Ed and just, I, I think it's wonderful you're doing this show to, you know, to do a tribute to him and I'm honored to be here. So thank you, Mick. Thank you. You bet. Um, and I hope y'all, if, if you're, if you're in, this is always the least professional thing anyone could ever do is ask a guest on the air, whether they'll do something later in the show, but there you have it. And here I am. So if, if Lee, if you'll do another track for us in a little while, that'd be great. I'd be honored to. Thank you. That is fantastic. Now, um, I want, before we go any farther, I want to welcome, uh, Bobby Ann Mason who's here. Um, good morning, Bobby Ann. Let's see, you've got your mic on mute, so, uh, but I'm sure you'll get that in a second. There we good go. Mo good morning. Sorry about that. Hi there. Um, so glad to have you. Yes, welcome. Um, Thanks. Bobby Ann Mason, the author of In Country, which was uh, has been taught widely in classes, made into the Norman Jewison film with Bruce Willis and Emily Lloyd. May I, I'm sorry, I just have to do this for a second, Bobby Ann. Finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for uh, her memoir, Clear, Clear Springs. Um, uh, Shiloh and Other Stories, the Penn Hemingway Award for First Fiction, the Kentucky Book Award for Girl in the Blue Beret and Elvis Presley, uh, Guggenheim Fellowship. It goes on and on. I'm sorry, Bobby, but I just have to do that because I'm so happy to have you here. <laughs> I'll stop you. now. Oh, Can you talk okay. a little bit about your friendship with uh, about your friendship with Ed? That might be um, too broad of a question. Well, <laughs> um. Ed was one of that bunch of guys from UK who had studied with Robert Hazel. And uh, I had, um, I was a few years younger than uh, Wendell Berry and James Baker Hall and <clears throat> Gurney Norman and Ed. Um, but I had Bob Hazel for a teacher too. And, and um, eventually met Ed through those other guys and, um, through Bob Hazel. Um, everybody thought I knew Ed <laughs> uh, all along since college days, but I didn't actually meet him until about 1983. And um, uh, the last conversation I had with Ed, he told me that he had been counting up in his head how many years we had been friends. And he said, 63 years. And I said, well, no, <laughs> that's impossible. I said, we didn't meet until 1983. And he said, well, as far as I'm concerned, we've been friends for 63 years, <clears throat> which was nice. <laughs> and so everybody thought I knew him all along. and. Uh, uh, because he was in that group and we were all associated together somehow. <laughs> when I first um, was in contact with Ed, he was working on um, one of those uh, things out in California, in Palo Alto. It might have been Place Magazine um, or the Free You, I don't remember. Um, and he I think he asked me to write a review of Gurney's um, Divine Rights trip. And I wrote it, but it was too academic for the purposes of that <clears throat> of, uh, California extravaganza. So uh, that got rejected. <laughs> and in the 1970s, early, I heard from him, no, I heard from maybe Esquire magazine. And, and they wrote me a, an official letter saying, we understand that you are the national president of the Hilltoppers fan club. And we'd like to know if you have a photograph to go with this piece by Ed McClanahan about one of the Hilltoppers. And I 
I said, well, no, I'm in my 30s. I, I'm not no longer the teenage national president. But uh, Ed wanted a picture of the Hilltoppers. And I had one that was my favorite one. And it was just a small picture. It was very good quality. And I didn't have a copy of it, but I sent it to Esquire. And um, I was thinking they'd pay me some money for it. And I don't think they did, but <laughs> I never got the photo back from Esquire. And um, that was a big loss, a big hole in my um, archive of National Hilltopper work. <laughs> and <Yeah>. um, <laughs> years later, years and years and years later, Ed, Ed ran across the photo and gave it to me. So, so it uh, worked out. Um, it is great so of him Ed, to sort of like keep that in mind, right? So like he, he like this is yeah, still simmering for yeah. Ed McClanahan and he, he doesn't forget about it. Yeah, it wasn't like he could uh, send it back to me when I wanted it <laughs> and, uh, or Esquire didn't send it. It just got pushed aside as so many things do. And um, so uh, Ed was at, uh, Western State College in Bowling Green, same time as the Hilltoppers. So he had this run in with Jimmy Saka, and he wrote about it, as you probably know, in Famous People I Have Known. And years later, there was a, a, one of the book fairs uh, in Lexington <laughs> took place, um, oh, that place by Rob Arena. And um, Ed was there. <laughs> with his latest book and Jimmy Sacco was there. He hadn't written a book, but there was a book about the Hilltoppers that had been written by a historian. And um, so Ed, Ed finally got to share some time with Jimmy Sacco and uh, he, he just loved it. What a nice guy, Ed said. <laughs> and uh, so I guess they, they hit it off and, and the rest is history. We actually have, I actually have some of the Hilltopper stuff that I believe I got from Ed. Um, and I could, mm -hmm. I could play something by, I could play a short Hilltopper song, or I could also play a little Ena song. Um, I think that these are both things that I, I know that guy Mendez is going to probably want to talk about little Enos. Um, mm -hmm. and so let me see if we, let me find a quick little, can I, is it okay with you guys if I play a Hilltopper song real quick? Sure. I've okay. heard them all. I, I, What's okay. your favorite, Bobby? Well, Bobby Ann, Ann Mason, as the former president of the Hilltoppers fan club, which song should I play? <laughs> I'll keep uh, trying. Trying. What? Trying. Trying is one of yep. the best. Yeah. My fa favorite is Poor Butterfly or Time Will Tell, but you probably I've don't got have them all. Handy. I've got, no, I've got all you, those. Uh, um, Ed used you, to sing you, Trying. You got, Let's do trying. Oh, God says did? trying oh, because good. Ed used to sing. Yeah. It. So let's play this real quick. Uh, this is trying. This is the Hilltoppers, okay. who were a national sensation um, in their day. And uh, this is Trivial Thursdays. We will be right back. This is the Hilltoppers with trying. I'm trying to forget you, but try as I may. Every day, no use trying to forget you, cause I realize that I'm trying to forget you with tears in my To 
impress you Hoping to possess you Now I know I have it a chance, dear There's no denying But you can't blame a fellow For trying And those teardrops Only remind me that I love you more and more So I'll put my foolish pride behind me And come knocking, knocking at your door And I'll be trying to impress you Hoping to possess you now I know I have it a chance, dear. There's no denying, but you can't blame a fellow for trying. That makes me want to cry. Sorry imagining Ed singing. Imagining Ed singing it. Yes, that uh, I could. I could understand. I, I could hear him singing it in my mind. I never actually heard him sing it, but uh, I could tell by everyone's expressions how much <laughs> it, it reminded them of Ed. So I'm glad that uh, Mick played that one. Uh, I hadn't heard that actually. I, you know, I hadn't heard much of the Hilltoppers. So this is kind of an introduction to the Hilltoppers for me. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> wow. This Ed is had two Thursdays. songs that he loved to sing. Mm -hmm. And I wish to God I could remember them. Maybe Guy can. One of them was The Land of Sky Blue Waters, which he wrote about honky tonks in Montana. But the other one yeah. is Jack the Bear. I Jack mean, the Bear. Yep. I, I thought if we ever have a memorial service for Ed, which he does not want to happen, but the last thing that should happen is we should all sing Jack the Bear. Can you sing it, Guy? Uh, we had Kate sent me a, a Vimeo of Ed and his daughter Annie singing it. Do you have that yes. by any chance? I do. I do have it, and I'm happy to <laughs> play it. I think he sang it on our show maybe before. He also. did, yeah. He sang yeah. it on the show more than once, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that was so much fun about Ed was Ed was he was not he was a man who was not afraid of a microphone. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and you know, I mean, that's not a unique uh, thing, but it's so great. Like, I mean, you could be like, I remember asking Ed the first time if he would sing because someone said, "Guy, it was you." Guy, Guy Mendez said, y "You should ask Ed to sing on the show." And so I remember asking him somewhat tentatively and really just expecting, I mean, I'd know him that well, but just kind of expecting him to sort of demure on some level, even if it was only for a moment. But he was like, no, of course, yeah, I'll be happy to sing on the show. <laughs> well, the drowning in the land of sky blue waters was, you know, a, a, a kind of ode to a drunk guy at a bar looking at a sign where the, the, the stream keeps rippling through uh, uh, for uh what is what's the beer? Um, um, hams, hams, yeah. And and he would sing it, you know. Of course, every time Ed read, he was singing. You know, it was all a song. Mm -hmm. um, and that was one of the wonderful mm -hmm. things about his writing was that it was uh, like music at times. And also, but, uh, oh. guy, guy, remember that Ed sings at the very end of the documentary we made about him. What, which does it, which song does he sing? He sings uh, uh, an old hippie with uh, Little Linus's daughter. <laughs> uh, so I'd I'm recommend fair. that that to I you. I think guys. I can make that happen. I do have a link <laughs> to the documentary, Paul. So I think I can make that happen. If uh, it's at the very does. end, but well, if you can, that's great. But also post the link so that people can get to it after the show. You know, uh, in that documentary, signature Ed McClanahan, it was the only time that I can ever remember that someone used the P word on KET and public television. 
And it was a joke about little Enos telling his mother when his mother said, shoot, Carlos, you should have told me he was coming. I'd have made some fried chicken and uh, for you all. And we, we were down there for a visit at his, old, his parents' home place. And he said, Enos said, shoot, Ma, I should have been a preacher. I like fried chicken and the P word as much as anybody. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we had to make two different versions of it. We had to make one version at KET where we took out the P word. And I think the national version had the P word in it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, let me see. I've got it. So let, we've got I've got Jack the Bear here, and oh, we good. can do that. Do, do Jack with, the uh, Bear, Annie. Yeah, with, yeah. With Annie, you and then I think everybody I can join in. <laughs> yeah, on the, cor on the chorus. So let's <laughs> so let's see. This is a video that uh, Annie McClanahan sent us by way of Guy Mendez, and um, let's see here. Kate, do, 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 Kate McClanahan sent. Oh, this. Oh, Kate sent it. Okay, right. Okay, it's with Annie. And yeah. uh, let's see. Uh, Annie did send her regards, by the way, from California, and she had she was happy that this was happening. Um, so this is just a little, a quick little clip here of uh, a song that guy that uh, Ed McClanahan loved to sing. He comes on like Jack the Bear. He ain't no hippie and he ain't no square. He's Jack the Bear of world renown. He's Jack the Bear from out of town. Hey, hey, Jack the Bear. Hey, hey, Jack the Bear. Jack the Bear is in cahoots. Big galoots in pinstripe suits. Jack the Bear ain't got no roots. Except the ones inside his boots. Hey, hey, Jack the Bear. Hey, hey, Jack the Bear. Jack the Bear has heard the news. He says that when you snooze, you lose. He says you reap just what you sow. Now Jack the Bear has got a blow. Hey, hey, Jack the Bear. Hey, hey, Jack the Bear. Oh, what's not to love about that? Uh, that was... We'll be saying humming that all day long now. Yes. <laughs> Does anyone have a Jack the Bear uh, recollection that they want to share? Well, Annie knew that well because he sang it to him every night when she, you know, when she and her brother Billy were growing up in Henry County. Yeah. I was mm -hmm. at that performance. I was in uh, uh, the Haight Street bookseller, I think, something like that. <clears throat> and yeah. afterwards, oh. Wavy Gravy suggested that we have a, uh, since we were shilling the book, Spit in the Ocean, he said we should have a spitting contest outside, which made sense at the time. <laughs> so we had a spitting contest outside, and then Wavy Gravy wrote a piece about the spitting contest that was better than the spitting contest. <laughs> I'd touching. like to say one thing about Spit in the Ocean, uh, all about Kesey. I've already, I don't want to presume this, but I've already had some people send me stuff saying that there ought to be something like that about Ed. And it doesn't need to be me, but I'd be happy to collect the stuff. Uh, anybody that's got reminiscences or piece of writing or a piece of art it'd be good to have all that in one place and and bill his son is his literary executor and i could at least get it to him but it'd be good to put that call out i think that's a great idea yeah yeah well, i i can't help but think you know ed just he, he sent it to some of you i mean he did a long manuscript during the pandemic hand jive about the story of his drawings that then Institute right. 193 exhibited and yeah. it ended up getting, you know, donated to the University of Kentucky Art Museum. But it's not really the story of the drawings. It's like the story of Ed's creative process. You know, I mean, it's like that's just what's floating on the on the surface to then tell this longer story. Um, but, you know, uh, Mark Sperry speaking, I think that that should come out some way. I mean, because it's what? 40 or 50 pages long. I mean, it's no, just... that's an absolutely epic exploration of his whole career. And while we're on that, um, the other thing, the kind of un, 
done business is there's a book length manuscript called the return of the son of Needmore. We need to finish it. Well, <laughs> I kept telling Ed just it, he, he, it, it's, it's all Ed and it's not even a draft. I mean, it's just perfect as far as I'm concerned up to like page 105. And then there's supposed to be this big courtroom scene and he never could really get it up for the courtroom scene. And who cares, you know, let's just <laughs> wrap it up and print the damn thing. And that and the, the thing that JT's talking about, that's a book right there. It's ready to go. Hmm. Well, before, before COVID got so bad, we had hoped to have a, an event at the Carnegie Center that would be kind of a reading and celebration of it. And so once, you know, the Omicron uh, variant allows, we want to uh, do that. So just keep in touch. And when, when things are safe, you know, we'll hope everybody can gather in the Carnegie Center and really celebrate it. Good. Absolutely. That's Tom Eblen of the Carnegie Center. Um, and, so there's this, uh, last, this, this last work is the return of the son of Needmore, which we need to see more of. <laughs> He read yeah, parts Harry, of it, Harry and they were great. When he's uh, middle aged, and Harry has come back to town, you've read it too, right, guy? I've only heard, heard or read parts of it. Uh, I have not read all of it. Is there a murder involved? Is there someone that gets blown up yes, on a front there's, porch? There's uh, somebody's. It's somebody got killed over their pot crop kind of deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, Ed wasn't a real churchy guy, but. He came once to, or twice maybe, to read at Christ Church Cathedral in a little series of author readings that we did there. And um, it seemed like one time he was really, he, he felt like his character, Harry Estep, and his, among other characters, that he thought his character were seeking redemption. And it's sort of, he himself was kind of seeking redemption. And it was an interesting, you know, sobering moment um you know beyond the job the the fun and the the you know the funny parts there was you know there was seriousness as well he's a magical realist and um i don't want to turn him into a christian necessarily no, no, no. but uh every one of the stories in congress of wonders ends on a uh, not a re religious, but a spiritual moment, which is otherwise inexplicable. Yeah. Redemption. You think there's yeah. redemption involved in a lot of these things, right? Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I was. I couldn't help but think of. Uh, yeah. When I was when I was looking into this, because I wasn't, you know, particularly, you know, I wasn't I wasn't factually informed of Ed's kind of spiritual leanings, but but I, I always remember the. I think it's the um, the the. Um, Isaac Newton Society, um, I think is what it is that uh, Kurt Vonnegut and a variety of others were in. And whenever one of their ranks would die, they would get together and they would say, well, so-and-so is up in heaven now. To, to which they would all j just like cry with laughter, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not, I don't mean to put that on Ed, but, but it is an interesting <laughs> observation. Well, you know, his is gravestone is going to say... Uh, Hey, Shuby in Brooksville. And there's another old friend of his who's buried across the way and his gravestone says, Hey, Ed. <laughs> I met you. Is that true? <laughs> it's absolutely he, true. Wasn't he in our documentary, Paul? Yeah. I don't, I don't think we had that in the documentary. We have a great pool room scene from Brooksville in the, in the documentary, but I, I missed that cemetery scene. Uh -huh. This is Trivial Thursdays on WRFL. Um, it's about 20 until noon, and uh, I've been enjoying the company of some magnificent uh, fellow friends of Ed McClanahan, uh, Tom Marksbury, um, as well as Tom Eblen, um, Paul Wagner, John Lackey, um, Lee Owen, JT Dockery, Bobby Ann Mason, and Guy Mendes, um, all who have their own personal recollections like so many do of uh of the great the great american writer ed mcclanahan i saw that i saw that listed somewhere and i like that that it, that he was called a an american writer um does would anyone like to address that uh, it, what's what was was there something distinctively american about about ed's writing well yeah, kurt vonnegut was mentioned a minute ago uh and i i had i was in a uh, 
photo, uh, photographic exhibit at the U of L Photo Archives, and uh, it was a show of portraits. And one of the other photographers was Jill Kremitz, and she brought her husband Kurt Vonnegut with her to the opening, and I brought Ed Clanahan with me, <laughs> and we stood in front of my picture of Little Enos and the Go Go Girls while Ed and Kurt talked about how each of them from different locales, Ed from Northern Kentucky, Kurt from Indianapolis, gravitated to Northern Kentucky to the strip clubs when they were teenagers. And they had a big time talking about strip clubs uh, in their youth in Northern Kentucky. And it was like, wow, these guys are bonding. <laughs> <laughs> and then he found out that Kurt was actually 10 years older than he was, which made him really feel feel good because he, he thought that, uh, you know, he was the same age and that uh, he felt good being 10 years younger. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of strip clubs, Guy, and we are speaking of strip clubs, um, <laughs> before I met Ed, I used to hang out at Boots's in Lexington, which we all know. And You gravitated there on your own? On my own, right. <laughs> well, of course, I had a lot of conservative friends uh, at the university who asked me why I was going to that place. And, and I, I, it was unexplainable to me, although Little Enos had a lot to do with it. And one of the great discoveries of my life was to realize that Ed, when I finally read, uh, you know, Famous People and realized that was Ed's hangout, I felt so vindicated and so excited about the prospect of actually meeting Ed, who I did eventually through Guy, that it was so great to feel like my life it was had been redeemed. It had some worth, despite the disparagement of all my friends at the time. When we first went to Boots Bar to hear Enos play, and the reason we went there is because my roommate and fellow co-conspirator on the Blue Tail Fly, Daryl Rice, also known as Bucky Young, uh, Daryl was a Fuller Brush salesman for a while, and he knocked on Carlos Toadvine's door and sold him some Fuller Brushes, and <laughs> Enos, little Enos, said he was playing that night at Boots Bar, so we go down there, and uh, you know, it was a low down kind of bar and Ed looked like a California hippie and I had long hair and a beard. And uh, we sit down at a table and from way across the room in the dark, someone skitters a beer bottle across the floor and it crashes against the wall right at our feet. And we persevered, stuck it out, got a beer and Enos got up on the, it was, you know, like a stage of a door on sawhorses and uh, go, go girls. <laughs> there was a deaf and dumb go, go girl who put her hand on the wall to get the beat. And uh, she came down from there and sat with some friends of hers and they were all signing. And there was two other, two guys and another girl got up and danced and one guy turned to the other and started making sh funny shapes and, you know, doing funny things and, and talking about the girl on the stage and the, the, the d deaf and dumb go-go girl that was sitting down with these two guys jumped up and shot him the bird and stomped off. It was this whole silent conversation of signing that had to do with, you know, um, Never mind. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there he is. There he is. The man himself. Yeah, I wanted to get this up for a second. Struggle. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> so when we, we, we took my uh, little recorder and recorded Enos at length, and then Ed took it back to California. It was the last I ever saw those tapes. And that's, and, uh, but later uh, came the... Uh, Ode on the Intimidations of Mortality, uh, the, the Little Enos story that was in Playboy. And that yeah. was right about the time of Enos's comeback. He was playing at the Fig Tree downtown, I think, uh, when he got published in Playboy. Uh, now, I can't, I want to mention for anyone who's listening who wonders about these sort of days gone by in Lexington, that, that Boots Bar is easily recognizable by anyone who, who even, who has no idea what we're talking about if you're driving down Broadway. Scott Street. Yeah. Scott Street. If you're driving down Broadway and you look up and you've ever wondered about that place up on the hill next to the railroad tracks with a gleaming copper roof. The Scott Hotel it was. That never seems to be done and yet it looks like it's done. For years now it's been this way. But this is this is where Boots Bar was, right? Yeah. And it's owned by one of Johnny's neighbors, I think. Uh or it was for a while. Um but uh yeah, Boots, and right across the street was Comer's, another dive bar with, you know. That's where I first saw the Table Toppers. Ah, mm -hmm. Little Enos and the Table Toppers. We've got, wow. so 
we have we, we're uh, we we still got a little bit of time left. We want to get another. We're going to have Lee uh, Owen play another song for us, but also. I don't want to let anybody get away. I don't want us to get away without talking about the blind corn liquor pickers who, who really, who took, this is what this really interesting, um, you know, this is when, um, I don't know if it's when it began, but you know, this is, this is a real interesting generational leap sort of where, where, where Ed was on the radar of these kind of much younger musicians, um, who, who, the, and then they collaborated on a song with him. Is that is, is that right? I think I think it's Little Enos. Is that the song? I hope it is. I, I don't know it. I think you don't I know. Think they took his his words, his writing, and and reshuffled some of it and used it um, in a song. And because Ed was responsible for the lyrics for the song, he had to join ASCAP. He had to become a member, a dues paying <laughs> member of the union. Let me play just a little bit of this. So this is Lexington, the Lexington based blind corn liquor pickers. And I do remember from Ed's visits to many visits to the show. Uh, yet he was, he would always mention, he was so proud of this. He was like, he was, he was quite proud of this, um, this affiliation, this, this recognition. I don't know what you, what, whatever, call it what you want. Um, but this is, so this is the song Little Enos by uh, the blind corn liquor pickers. And uh, we will be back with uh, a little bit more time with our friends, the McClana fans, uh, as we celebrate the life of the great Kentucky and American writer Ed McClanahan. Um, so a little bit of, of Little Enos by um, the Blind Corn Liquor Pickers. Guitar, left hand, and one of us string. A little Enos rocking down at the zero lounge. If Elvis was a pedal, then just one name will do. If Elvis was a pedal, then just one name will do. He's a squat stick of dynamite with a nine inch fuse. Sweet, black, white, grown helmet like this, gonna give him a ride of a Sick and sheen. Guitar left handed, don't reverse the string. A little Enos rocking down at the Zebra Lounge. His head like a house cat, ribs like a hunger hound dog. His head like a house cat, ribs like a hunger hound dog. He's 225, belly five. With the women, Lord, he's smoother than you think. With the women, Lord, he's smoother than you think. Hell, a man gets laid where another couldn't get a drink.
listen to that. Um, I just wanted to play a little bit of Little Enos. A, li- a Little Enos. <laughs> and uh, for our guests here on Trivial Thursdays, uh, that was Swinging Doors from Little Enos. And uh, I believe I got that. That did come from Ed. I believe Ed was the one who gave me the, the Little Enos record. And I may have even sort of gone back and kind of f- f- uh, futzed with it a little bit and kind of tried to improve some of the levels and stuff. Um, so that's from the album, I Kept the Wine and Threw Away the Roses, which I just love that name so much, <laughs> right? And, and let's see, before that, then, we heard the Blind Corn Liquor Pickers with Little Enos, the track which we think that's the one. I've asked this question many times. It's starting to become a joke. I've asked this group of people over and over again, which song is the Blind Corn Liquor Pickers song that, that Ed McClanahan's associated with? And so, finally, I believe from, uh, from Beth from uh from the blind corn liquor pickers i think that's the one that we heard so well it sounds like a song he would have written yeah (laughs) and he i believe he was known to get up on stage with him from time to time and well just just we'll just end it there ed was prone to get up on stage period right (laughs) (laughs) um let's see we've got we've just got a few minutes here left and i want to maybe go around and see um what anyone would like to add um and i certainly want to uh i want to check in with bobby ann mason who i'm so happy to have visiting with us here and wondering if uh, any of this has sparked any memories for you um for you bobby ann about about your your friend and colleague um, ed mcclanahan oh i had a very different relationship with him than you guys did I didn't know about little Ennis and didn't <laughs> do all that. <laughs> um, Can we believe and, her? Do we believe her? <laughs> this full, discla- um, full disclaimer. Ed, Ed and, and I um, uh, responded to words. We had a, a kind of um, understanding about the delight of words. And um, um it had been years since i had read the natural man and i've um ran across an obituary of uh someone in the lexington paper a, a death of a man named rex wrote <laughs> r-e-x-r-o-a-t and i had forgotten that that was a, a very big name in Ed's um, novel, The Natural Man, and maybe the others hadn't come out yet. Anyway, I, I wrote to Ed and said, I found this fabulous name in the obituaries, and you can have it um, unless I get it first or something like that. <laughs> and he responded as if I, I knew what I was talking about. <laughs> and I found out later, oh, yeah, that was why the name was so familiar. Um, and um, uh, well, I also, um, uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Philander Cosmo Rex wrote BS, MS, <laughs> PhD, internationally acclaimed explorer, globetrotter, author, archaeologist, zoologist, ichthyologist, herpetologist, <laughs> lepidopterist, philatelist, cosmologist natural theosophist, <laughs> minister of the gospel, and licensed practitioner of colonic irrigation. <laughs> um, you, you see, the reason it took Ed 21 <sighs> years or whatever to write The nat- Natural Man <laughs> is that he was so in love with words and so careful about words and um, would not um put them out unless he had them just right and so um it was just um i guess our mutual fascination with words especially funny words and um and uh, if if you have time for a minute um i would just like to read you the blurb the blurb that i wrote on um not even immortality lasts forever because it Um, The question was, is he an American writer? Okay, Um, here's what I wrote. To tell about his early years in Kentucky 
Ed McClanahan has channeled the voice of Mark Twain and propelled us off to military camp and Southern Gentlemen's College. You'll want to, re to read this book just to find out what he did with the dress code there. And even to an extravagant launching party of his parents' houseboat, from tall tale to artful hyperbole, the verbal wizardry in this fabulous book is tops. McClanahan always has a blast with words, running the language around in circles. He can't just say a humble abode when a humble ensquatment will do. <laughs> so much here is fresh, fresh and invigorating and often tender and sweet. His portrayal of his father is especially touching, and there are dogs. I will treasure this memoir forever. It's immortal. Okay, that's that's my Ed. That's Bobby and Mason. Thank you so much for that. That was yes. Amazing. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this show has gone far too quick. Um, I, I can't tell you how honored I am to have everyone here who's been here to celebrate Ed McClanahan with us. Hey, Mick. Um, yes, sir. Please. We're going to um, have a West Six, uh, where we would have lunch every week, is going to put up a, a couple of pictures of Ed on aluminum uh, above where he would sit in, uh, in, in the brewery there every Friday. And probably in March on the during their 10th anniversary celebration, but and I think we're gonna I might put this uh, a quote from him that was in Ace Magazine in the obit there something about how all of his fiction stemmed from things that really happened to him, while his nonfiction was really just a pack of lies. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's so great. <laughs> that's perfect. After uh, I'll say this real quick. After I think after I was actually finished with white and the frog print i found out that there was a real luther two nose jukes and i was like ed that's real there was a real two nose what and he, he was worried somebody up with dynamite that actually happened in the cracking count what what he was worried that there were relatives of two nose jukes that would uh come, come after him <laughs> Yeah, it was still a concern. Mm -hmm. We were talking about doing something in Brooksville with the Troy T. T, T Troy T Guard was going to put on, but the pandemic canceled all of our events for the books. And Ed was still worried about it. And I was like, Ed, I don't think anybody like is really is going to care or is still around. But he was still worried that that might offend me. That if I've got Docker. just a second, I wanted to say. Uh, Go ahead, Tom. Ed please. and I did, uh, we did two <laughs> collections. And one of them, I is my Vita, if you will, which in rock and roll terms is sort of assorted B-sides and rarities. And the other one's called I Just Hitched In From The Coast, which is sort of greatest hits and a few that will be. But either one of those would have been an excuse for somebody else to call it a career. And I just think it's interesting that Ed ended up doing more writing after he was 70 than before he was 50. In our documentary, he said he wasn't going to write anymore, and that was like yeah. 1996 or 1998. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, well, I remember visiting just a year or two ago. I guess it was right before the pandemic, and he was still like collecting funny little things he'd seen in the newspaper. And I remember one particular, he, you know, going through obits and finding funny names that he came one. It was Nelly Jelly, and I just suggested it might be a long lost cousin to Wavy Gravy. But <laughs> whatever he said. But he was still collecting stuff, you know, all the time. Again, I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, we're kind of yes. we're wrapping up here, and I want to send us out with another song uh, that that Lee Owen might play for for Guy. Um, before I do, I want to thank all of you. I want to thank Tom Marksbury, as well as J.T. Dockery and Tom Eblen, um, Bobby Ann Mason, Paul Wagner, John Lackey, and Guy Mendez. Um, all true blue friends of our star spangled maniac ed mcclanahan <laughs> um and so thank you all so much for being here Thanks. um and for remembering ed so fondly i knew that this would be just the thing for that and um so oh, maybe wave. yes <laughs> 
Uh, we'll let Lee, Lee, would you like to take us out with something? What do you have in mind for Ed to close us out here? I'd be honored. Again, I've played Grateful Dead around here for a long time. So uh, I've been asked to play some memorial services and funerals over the years. And this one's the one in the Grateful Dead catalog that always seems very appropriate for that. So I'll throw it out to Ed this time. This is called Broke Down Palace. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for listening to Trivia Thursdays. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, man. Well, fare you well, my honey. Well, fare you well, my only true one. Cause all the birds that were singing all flow except you alone. Palace on my hands and my knees. I will roll, roll, roll. Make myself a bed by the water side. In my time, in my time, I will roll, roll, roll. Fare you well. Listen to the river sing sweet songs to rock my soul. River gonna take me, sing me sweet and sleepy. Sing me sweet and sleepy all the way back home it's a far gone lullaby sung many years ago mama mama many worlds i've come since i first left home going home going home by the waterside we'll rest my bones and Listen to the river sing sweet songs to rock my soul. I'm gonna plant a weeping willow by the bank's green edge. It will grow. Grow, grow, sing a lullaby beside the water. The lovers come and go, river it roll, roll, roll. Fare you well, fare you well. I love you more than words can tell. Listen to the river sing sweet songs to rock my soul. Go listen to the river sing sweet songs to rock my soul. Very you well, Ed. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to Trivial Thursdays and for this celebration. You all take care. Um, and that's it. That's all I got to say. So thanks to everybody for joining. <laughs> Thank <us>. you, everyone. <laughs> and we will catch you. We'll catch you later. And Ed will see you around in our own ways. So the moment
hours pass into hours, the hours pass into years, and as she smiles through her tears, she murmurs low, the moon and I know that she'll be faithful, I'm sure she'll come. By and by, but if she don't come back, then I never sigh or cry. I just must die. She don't come back, then I never sigh or cry. I just must die. Poor butterfly, the moon and I know that she'll be faithful. I'm sure she'll come. Must die.